Hello everyone and welcome back to the Iris Pod. I'm delighted to say today I'm joined by the excellent Julian Treasure, uh, TED Talk speaker with over 100 million views, author and the founder of The Sound Agency. And we're going to be talking everything sound, noise and I guess the art of listening. But I'm going to start with this, Nada Brahma. <laughs> That's a great phrase. The world is sound is one a translation of that. Uh, and it's also the title of a wonderful book by um, Hans-Joachim Berendt, I think was his name, which I found a lot of fun. Kind of goes off the rails towards the end, I think, but there's a lot of really good stuff in there. So where I wanted to start with this, um, listening is a skill. I, I really picked up on that point from you know more than one of your of your TED Talks. And you make a really simple but really important point that that is not taught. Why, why are we not listening properly and what are we doing to address that that's a really great point and it's something that frustrates the heck out of me actually that we teach reading and writing avidly in schools you know it's a scandal if a child leaves school unable to read or write but we barely teach speaking and even less so listening which of course is a silent skill and the problem is most people don't even realize that listening is a skill it's confused with hearing it's conflated with hearing and hearing of course is a capability you know if you're not damaged in some way and there are of course millions of people in the world who are suffering from hearing loss we can talk about that later maybe uh, but uh, if you have perfect hearing it's a capability your ears work they're a miracle you know you're the, the tiny little membrane about the size of your little fingernail is decoding everything from explosions to Beethoven's symphony it's it's amazing but it's a capability. You don't have to think about it, like breathing or your heart beating it just happens. Listening is different. It's a skill that you can master, that you can practice. And it's a really important skill for life. And this, unfortunately, is completely un really untaught in schools. So children are expected to kind of pick it up as they go along. And how do you pick up a skill if you don't even know it's a skill? That's the issue and uh, really something that we need to do something about, you know, especially if you look at the world right now. Never have we needed listening more than we do at the moment. Politicians go off and have talks. I wish they'd go off and have listens instead. <laughs> Great point. And um, leads me to my next discussion point, really, uh, and you've already touched on it, how the importance of this has probably become even more relevant over the last couple of years and, and not to do another podcast about pandemic and all of these sorts of things. But it's certainly ushered in a world where we are more virtual, where we are taking um, benefit from various technologies and tools out there. And I wonder whether it's forced us into a position where people realize that they need to pay attention a little bit more and, and listen. Well, I hope so. And uh, actually, that opens up a, a whole and very interesting area of conversation because there's an audio revolution happening. And I mean, you guys are part of this. Uh, audio has been, you know, um, really second class citizen for a very long time. We, we lived, we've lived for a long time in an ocular culture. Things are designed uh, to look good. You know, the word design, there are hundreds of design awards around the world, and <laughs> very few of them for sound. Um, so, you know, our ears have been second rate, second class citizens for a long time, but that is changing. There are organizations that we all know and are very familiar with spending billions and billions right now on speech recognition, voice synthesis, uh, so that we can speak and listen instead of to technology i'm talking about primarily and to each other of course without using our eyes and our fingers so for so long we've been slaves of screens you know people walk around looking down uh, i mean i give you an anecdote i remember at ted which i've i've visited many times one of the great things about ted as with many conferences is when you're queuing for admission to one of the auditoria for the next session you talk to the people in the queue at least you used to more recently, whenever I've been at TED, you stand in a queue <clears throat> and everybody is looking at their hand and there's very little conversation going on. So we're enslaved 
with this sort of screen and then you've got FOMO of course which makes it all much worse we have to check every five minutes if somebody's tagged us or emailed us or whatever it might be now that is changing in not few not very many years from now we'll be talking to the internet to devices to an intelligent agent most of all and listening to that intelligent agent you think about something like Jarvis from Iron Man I mean artificially intelligent not just a bunch of scripts which is what most of the things you know Siri and Alexa and so forth are now they just run scripts in response to predetermined conversations no I'm talking about something which is artificially intelligent which will contain all of the things that we need in order to function in the world pin numbers and whatever you know we have got so bogged down with having to remember pin numbers and having verification codes sent to us every five minutes and so forth all screen based stuff that's going to change it'll be based on biometrics it'll be based on uh, our voice um, and you know there's there's an issue there with deep fakes of course which is something else that is arising but we will be living in an auditory age where brands will have to really have an auditory presence otherwise they'll cease to exist in many circumstances and where we'll have this intelligent agent that we speak to uh, that does everything for us book things and you know um, make transactions and and so forth so sound is going to be many many times more important than it has been for many decades now absolutely and um, one of our investors is Roger Taylor of, of the band Queen and uh, he made this point in a in a short video he did for us where he said the the visual component has been the focus the sound component has been left behind and and uh, depending on how much time we've got today we can talk about compression and and all of these other things but um, I was really struck by the point that you made about sound containing spatial information that sound is our journey through life in terms of where we've been and where we're going to um, and that in the digital compression and, and streaming process, we, we lose that. We lose that spatial aspect. And of course, a producer comes in and tries to engineer space with panning and reverb and echo and all of these things. But the core of it is lost. And, and that in many ways is not very good for us. Um, tell us your insights on that whole piece around how sound is so important in our place in the universe. Well, our ears are incredibly subtle and uh, sound listening is a very important sense in, in really three dimensions of life. First of all, time. Hermann Hesse said, music is time made aesthetically perceptible. That's a lovely way to describe the, uh, the function of one function of music, uh, because really we very often tell how long something's been going on through our ears rather than through our eyes. You know, we'll be having this conversation for uh, 40 minutes or maybe more. Not much will change visually between us. You'll be sitting there, I'll be sitting here. It'll look pretty much the same. But we will have a sense of how much time has passed by how many words have been said. That's listening. That's listening and time. Uh, and music, of course, is very much about that. So that's one dimension. Another dimension is relationship. And listening, I mean, what's the most common complaint in a relationship? He or she never listens to me. So listening is a way that we connect. It's how we connect with other human beings much more pr profoundly, I think, than text ever can. And the third dimension is the one you're talking about, which is placing us in space uh, here and now. Uh, we, we are very conscious of the room we're in from the tiny noises it makes from the reverberations you know you can tell the size of the room you can tell with your eyes shut how many people are around with you very quickly and your ears are doing that all the time uh, plus of course orientation uh, and also um, there's a spiritual dimension to that not just you know the earthly position that we're in but also listening very much is at the heart of every spiritual practice I know of in the world, quiet meditation, listening, whether it's to yourself or to some sort of deity or whatever it might be. So listening places us in the universe very firmly. And that's an important part of being human, really. And uh, it's very, I mean, it's fascinating. If you look at the history of music over the years, and David Byrne did a great TED talk about this, 
um, the the venues for music have really developed in a kind of symbiosis with the music. So you wouldn't want to listen to plain song in a dead uh, uh, studio recording room. It, it's designed to be in a cathedral with seven second reverberation time. Uh, on the other hand, there are lots of sorts of music which, you know, you wouldn't want to listen to a rock band in a cathedral because it would be a mush very quickly. Uh, so venues have developed to support the music, whether it's chamber music, rock music, you know, club music, whatever it might be. Uh, the venue and the music are in a sort of symbiosis together. And so the space in which the music happens is really important. And uh, that's something people have tried a long time to replicate with sound systems. You know, obviously, we go to a cinema, you've got an 11.1 surround sound system, which is fantastic. But not many people have got that at home. Most of us have stereo, maybe 5.1 surrounds uh, for films. But there's not a lot of music that's delivered in surround. I mean, you can get some. I've been enjoying Stephen Wilson's uh, 5.1 surround sound remasters of lots of my favourite prog rock classics um, and they're fantastic uh, but it's you know it's an effort to get there and you're certainly not going to get that very often through headphones which is most people's access to high quality sound you know you can get uh, a really rich sonic experience for what a tenth uh, of the cost if you're using brilliant headphones compared to uh, having to put it into amplifiers and loudspeakers and so forth. So uh, yeah, I think it's uh, space is very important and the spatial aspect, the context of music or all sound actually is really important. The, um, the pursuit of streaming companies seems to be in providing, there's almost been an HD drive because that's the next logical thing that they need to provide higher fidelity. You know, the, you talk about lossless or back to the, the artist's original intent. Where do you see it going next? What, what do you think the next advancement in that connection to the original artist's intent may be? Well, that's an interesting question. Um, I mean, I certainly enjoy HD music. I, I have a, um, a you know, sound is really important to me, so I've invested quite a lot of my my capital into equipment over the years. And I have an amazing music centre um, made by Resolution Audio called a Cantata, uh, which seamlessly handles 192 bit, 96 bit, uh, whatever it, whatever is thrown at it really. And it's a joy to listen to really high definition digital music. I'm not one of those people who. Um, bangs on about vinyl and analog uh, very much at all really I mean I don't miss the cracks and pops and all of the stuff that went along with playing a record even on a good turntable um, and I do think really high quality high definition digital music is, is fantastic uh, where that's going to go from here I don't know I mean there's got to be a limit to how many samples uh, and how many bits you can throw at a piece of music. I mean, is anybody going to be able to tell the difference? I can't tell the difference between 96 and 192, I have to say. Um, even, you know, I'm wearing some very nice headphones, which were given to me a while ago by Audizy, who um, I did some work with. I don't think I would have bought these. They were very expensive. Um, and they're fantastic. Um, I'm looking forward to experiencing your headphones uh, when they arrive as well. Uh, I do love the feeling of high quality sound. Where it's going to go, I don't know. I mean, I would think spatial is got to be has got to be it because we're still stuck in this planar world where you know it's stereo and it's one dimension, well, two dimensions. It's you know it's you don't get height, uh, so it is actually one dimension, isn't it? It's width. You don't get height and you don't get depth. Um, I have experienced some amazing systems um, which attempt to replicate height and depth using, you know, dozens of loudspeakers. Well, they're very expensive. Uh, if there's ever a way to do that in a practical way, uh, that would be great because we are moving into this, you know, this era of virtual reality and augmented reality and so forth. And we'll need a bit more than stereo if we're going to replicate those kind of environments effectively. 
Absolutely. Yeah. We were recently out at South by Southwest in Austin and there was a lot of talk about the metaverse. And I have to say, I was left incredibly underwhelmed with everything beyond the kind of gimmicky gaming, of course, is loved by by millions. Um, but I felt as a productivity environment that we're going to um, move towards and probably been accelerated towards in the last couple of years, I felt like the real ability to form relationships, uh, communicate effectively and enjoy the metaverse in what it pertains to be somewhat lacking and not fully thought through. And certainly an aspect of that, again, has been focused on the visuals, but failing to really um, fully innovate on the on the spatial sound aspect of it. And, you know, someone that we work with recently said, you know, whilst you can see each other on screen, the real content and value is delivered in the words that, that are being said. That's where the the real nub of content actually is. Yeah, I agree. But, you know, before we get too wound up in the, the leading edge and where we may be in years to come, there's so much to do right now in moving people away from listening to, you know, terribly compressed music uh, on really cheap equipment, um, doing video conferencing on laptop loudspeakers and microphones in public places. You know, there's, there's a lot of stuff right now where audio is really shocking. And I, I think probably the priority is moving with that first and then you know maybe there'll be something totally mind-blowing in the future maybe we'll have audio going straight into our brains somehow i don't know but um there's a lot to get right right now and there's you know there's a huge amount of education that's required really i'm thinking you know particularly about kids abusing their hearing with cheap headphones and ramming 100 decibels deep into their ear canals for hours a day and flattening those tiny hair cells which will not regrow. Uh, there was research showing that one in six American teenagers has got noise induced hearing loss already. And this is from headphone abuse. You know, it's not from attending gigs night after night. Um, any, you know, sensible DJ or musician now is wearing silicon molded earplugs, uh, possibly with monitors embedded in them so that they're getting a lovely mix at a sensible level and they're not killing their hearing. Um, but I feel sorry for people who you know, work in even bars where the noise level is truly shocking, you know, 110 decibels, everybody yelling at the top of their voice, loud music pounding away. That's killing people's hearing night after night. That is going to do a lot of damage. So I think there's a lot of education that we need to do about the quantity of sound and about the quality of sound also. And I'm forever uh, you know, I do I do webinars about video, video conferencing and virtual communication. And um, I think it's really important for anybody who takes this seriously in business uh, or in life to do a few little things like get an external high quality microphone. It doesn't cost that much. Set it up so that your sound is really good. Uh, have good quality headphones so that you're not getting into sort of um, echo cancellation ne being necessary. Um, and most of all, you know, if you're talking about video conferencing, of course, where the video is an optional extra, you know, if the video goes down, we can still carry on perfectly well, can't we? Audio is crucial. Uh, so it's called video conferencing. It's actually audio conferencing with optional video. And if the audio goes down, what are we going to do? Hold up bits of paper, use sign language, you know. So the sound, yeah, the sound is the sound is the most important thing. Nevertheless, if you're going to do this, uh, with the video, the most important rule number one is camera at eye level. I have lost count of the number of even CEOs that I talk to with video conferencing where there's a laptop on the table in front of them. The screen is tilted back and basically the, the shot is right up their nose and often with a window behind them so you can't see them. It's not the most effective way to go. So camera at eye level, absolutely crucial. Great point. And actually, moments before we jumped onto this call, we got the the, the riser for the laptop so that you're you're roughly at eye level. Um, it's it's a very important um, tip. Uh, before we get into productivity and back into communication, just continuing on the point about compressed audio. You talk about hearing loss because we're listening on you know poor 
headphones and we're dialing the volume right up and you know that's not going to be good for us um what other health benef- uh, health impacts are there with consumption of poor audio over many many hours even things like anc and some other technologies that are designed to make our experience in the moment uh, a good one but maybe have longer term detrimental effects well, I haven't seen any research on those things, but I do have a, a, a really solid belief that, first of all, if we take compressed music, you know, we, and we're talking about not audio compression, not squashing the signal so that the peaks and troughs aren't too loud or too quiet. We're talking about compressing the, the file, making the file smaller which we do by using a format like MP3. And there are still plenty of people, thanks to, unfortunately, Apple, you know, putting thousands of songs in your pocket, where it all became about limited storage and how many songs can I get in there. Um, That has resulted in lots of people's music libraries being at 64 kbps, or even less, shockingly. And the quality of that is not great. There's a lot missing. Your brain has to do a lot of work to imagine the missing bits. It's all done with, um, you know, clever technology um, and that that's absolutely fine, but you still are having to do a lot of work. And I think that's fatiguing. So the, up, the upshot of that kind of compression, I think, is stress and fatigue. Plus, there's a tendency to turn it up because you're missing so much. You want to get that bass. You want to get that visceral feeling of being engaged with the music so you turn it up and then hearing damage is the result can i just pause for a moment i don't know if you're hearing my dog barking but it's really bothering me Uh, maybe maybe um clarity is um taking it out but um can i just pause for a moment turn off the video we were unaware of your of your dog but um please pause for a moment and uh yeah sort that out I'll be right back. Take me about two minutes. Just, just of hold on. Hi, I'm back. And uh, green now without a dog barking. But um, that's testament to your application. I have to say, then, <laughs> if you didn't notice it, because it was very audible to me. <laughs> no, but I guess that mix of technologies of, you know, iris clarity. And we can dig into focus and productivity in, in a second. Um, But with other technologies, maybe with noise cancelling headphones, it's a kind of, I think you've already said, you know, you need a a microphone. If you're going to take this seriously, get your camera at the right level and set yourself up with a environment to really do the job that you that you wish to do or enjoy the content that you wish to enjoy. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm not saying that there's there's nothing wrong with having a shot up somebody's nose if it's a family call and, you know, let's keep this in proportion. But If you want to make a seriously good impression in business, then these things are very simple to sort out. And it's amazing how people just don't pay attention to them at all. Uh, And particularly the sound quality is, you know, crucial, I think. Uh, So we were talking about the health effects, tiredness, fatigue, stress, definitely those things. Hearing damage, definitely that. Uh, And I think it's really important, as I said, to start to educate people to change the relationship with sound to start the world listening and that that's my whole mission if you want to put it in a nutshell i'm a listening evangelist that's what i'm all about because if we don't pay attention to the sound around us then you're cutting the the sense of responsibility both for the sound i consume you know if i'm not conscious of it then I'll be sitting in noise. You know, I see people standing on street corners shouting at each other as somebody drilling right next to them. I think, why don't you move? But people don't. I used to commute in London uh, on the tube to Waterloo Station on the Bakerloo Line. And as the tube train comes into Waterloo Station on the Bakerloo Line, there's a, a curve which causes the wheels of that tube train to emit a piercing shriek as it comes around that that bend. And I would be standing there with my fingers in my ears, wincing and looking in astonishment up the platform as everybody else is just standing there reading books or talking to each other and ignoring it. That's that's really killing your hearing. That sound, I mean, it's like 120 decibels of hideous shriek. So there's this kind of um, 
loss of connection, this unconsciousness about sound, which is damaging because we are affected badly by noise. I mean, sound affects us. And it's really important to establish that. There was my first TED talk was about that. And, and you know, I still travel the world talking about this because people are so unconscious. Sound changes our bodies, heart rate, breathing, hormone secretions, brain waves. All of those things are changed by sound. You know, just think about what happens to you if there's a sudden sound behind you. You know, if a twig snaps behind you in a forest, you spin around, you've got reflexes. And that's your lizard brain. It's the, it's, it's the lowest part of your brain because sound is your primary warning sense. And that's how we survived for a long time. How, you know, there's not a vertebrate on this planet that doesn't have ears. There are plenty that don't have eyes. So hearing primary warning sense really affects us physiologically very deeply. And then sound changes our feelings. Just think about music and how that does it. Also the bird song. I mean, we've used birdsong at the sound agency a lot in public places uh, because it's a, a very reassuring sound. When the birds are singing, you know it's time to... Uh, you, well, first of all, you know it's safe, and secondly, it's, um, it's time to be alert and awake because it's morning time. So it's a great sound to work to. If anybody is having to work in noise and you want to pop some headphones on, I would strongly recommend birdsong rather than music. Music's lovely but it's also quite distracting. It, you know, there's not a lot of music which is made to be in the background. Most music is made to be listened to. So you're trying to work and the music's going, listen to me, listen to me, listen to me. So you're replacing a distracting, nasty sound with a distracting, nice sound. It's still distracting. And then the third way sound affects us is cognitively. We can't think with noise. You know, just think about trying to write something when there's people talking behind you. You, you can't do it. We have very limited bandwidth for audio, actually. Um, we've got a huge storage. Our brain is amazing. But in terms of processing audio, then you can't, for example, understand two people talking at the same time. Not possible. And the final way sound affects us is behaviorally. Now, there was a great study done by some academics in a supermarket. They had two gondola ends, one with French wine, one with German wine, identical visual displays. And they just alternated the music, French music one day, German music the next day. On the French music days, French wine outsold German wine five bottles to one, which may not be surprising. But on the German music days, German wine outsold French wine two bottles to one. So that's just a music condition that most people hadn't even noticed. And look how it changes our behaviour. So becoming conscious of sound, I think, we all owe it to ourselves. It's part of having a commitment to my well-being to be conscious of the sound I'm consuming and what it's doing to me. It's also becoming more conscious as a human being, which, of course, has got to be a good thing. Fascinating. I, I absolutely love it. And, um, yeah, it's the other parallel to, I guess, the smell of the freshly baked bread into the into the supermarket that they've done for for years to try and get people to buy more bread the 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 sound analogy and experiment there is is just fascinating um you know i i really i really um i love what you're saying i mean our mission is to enable the world to to listen well and we do that through a technology which enables you to to actively listen um and we're we're excited to share more of what that's doing with you and and hopefully you can experience the headphones and enjoy them um but that leads us into a really nice um functional use case which is which we've already touched on which is these types of online meetings um and the ability to be productive in those because that's ultimately what we're trying to do and actually shorten our working day by spending less hours on calls like this well this is the key point about cognition of course because we use an inner voice a lot when we're working, particularly if we're writing or dealing with numbers. And we, we have to listen to that inner voice. And with that limited bandwidth for audio, you can't listen to your inner voice and somebody else at the same time. We have no ear lids, uh, dear listener, you may have noticed this. And therefore, if somebody's talking behind you, you are genetically programmed to decode language, as long as it's your language. Instantly, even if it's somebody else's language, it's still pretty distracting. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
So you're genetically programmed to decode it. It's going into your ears. Your brain is working away, listening to that person, even if you don't want to. And it dramatically reduces your capability of working with words or numbers or whatever solo working it is you're trying to do, planning things and so forth. Uh, the numbers vary. There's been lots of research about this over the years, but they all show a huge dip in productivity in open plan offices, for example. It can be as much as two thirds of your productivity is lost. In other words, you're, th you're three times more productive in a quiet room than in an open plan, noisy office. Now, I have to say these are generalizations and they're not true for everybody. I have no doubt that there are some people out there who work far better with loud death metal playing. I'm not one of them. But in general, for most people, less noise distraction equals more productivity. And unfortunately, <clears throat> architects are now covering the world with open plan office space. And there's something like six billion square feet of it out there and growing. Um, it's now almost anathema to have a closed office for anything other than a meeting. And that means that this phenomenon is really getting widespread. And I've had arguments with people like Google over the, over this in, in the past. You know, they're totally into freeform communication, it's community, it's people getting on with each other, it's teams being able to interact and so forth. Mm. The latest research shows that even for team working, open plan is challenging because people start to send emails simply because they don't like being overheard by other people in open plan offices. So you actually get less collaboration going on in that kind of a scenario. We all feel a bit naked, you know. Mum, can I call you back? Because there are 12 people listening to me. And even if, even if it's not mum, if it's a client, it's still quite intimidating to be overheard by everybody, particularly actually if it's a very quiet office. You know, offices can be too quiet as well as they can be too noisy. I've been in offices where the turning of a piece of paper is a major event and people like tut when you do that. So uh, that is a, an extremely distracting environment, even if it's, you know, pin quiet. One person taking a phone call is going to put off everybody else in that room. So we have to think carefully about creating audio environments which support people in what they're doing. You know, maybe that quiet space is a quiet working space and you don't take calls in there. And then you have another space which is collaborative. You have another space which is social. It's called activity based working and it, it is a very important new phenomenon in designing offices. People move themselves to the space that supports the working style that they want to adopt and they do that flexibly through the working day. So it's not about that's my desk. It's about spaces where you can go and find, uh, you know, a, a conducive atmosphere to do the work you want to do. Um, we talk about the bringing control to the uncontrollable environment. And of course, you know, conversations like this one or the hours of meetings that you're doing, you have not only the distractions around you and the noise, but also happening at the other end of the call and we had a, a nice example with your with your dog earlier although we didn't hear hear your dog so um, which is testament to our technology working um, is this something as we move into a different kind of world and way of working is this something that we need to address in a certain way to ensure productivity connection between the individuals and participants in hours and hours of, on, of online meetings it certainly feels like you know, my life was spent like that and continues to be spent like that, even as we move out of the pandemic. Oh, yeah, I think so. Um, otherwise, we're, you know, we are going to condemn ourselves to, uh, first of all, sitting in offices next to people who are having video conferences on laptop speakers, which we can all listen to. That's going to be really disturbing hearing. It's bad enough hearing one end of a conversation without hearing both ends uh, or the whole world is wearing headphones the whole time. Um, now, I think that is going to get sorted in the years to come because part of our conversation about the audio revolution is um, the development of devices which currently are wearables. I mean, you know, the big headphones I'm wearing are quite old fashioned and they're dedicated to music quality. I wouldn't walk around with these. Well, I can't, they've got a cable. Um, Obviously, there are very, very small in-ear devices now that we can use. And there's a, 
a convergence, I think, very interestingly happening in industries where uh, people who've got very smart technology like you guys um, are going to be bumping up against people who, for example, make hearing aids, which are incredibly smart devices now and uh, can be controlled with you know, a, a handheld device and can do all sorts of different things. You know, there's a reason Apple spent all those billions on Dr. Dre, because they could see this coming. Um, we are going to be experiencing the world very largely through our ears. Now, at the moment, that is to the ex exclusion of other auditory input, but it doesn't have to be. Uh, one of the interesting meetings I had at TED was with a guy called Neil Harbison, who's the human cyborg. He is colorblind, but he hears color. And he does that by having a device implanted in the back of his skull. It's a steel plate, uh, which is on the back of his skull. And attached to that is a rod which comes over the front and hangs down in front of his eyes here. Well, not just above them, so it doesn't disturb him. That is a color sensor. And by pitch shifting the frequencies of the color, uh, light is only one octave, so it's quite easy. You can pitch shift it down hundreds of times and get it into the auditory spectrum and that vibrates the plate in the back of his skull so he feels slash hears color through bone conduction and it wow. works for him you know, and you can look him up it's an interesting ted talk he gave about this now i would see that happening very much in the future and i've i've tried bone conduction headphones there are some on the market they're they're okay i mean they'd be all right for voice they're not great for music i would say at the moment but if you start to move that device on into an implant i think in not that many years maybe a decade maybe two decades it'll be pretty much de rigueur to have some sort of implant in our skull so that we can hear other things through bone conduction as well as the world around us and you know using ambient noise compensation circuitry or perhaps active noise um, uh, com uh, uh, compensation um, uh, what's it called active noise <laughs> help me out here I've gone senile for a moment uh, what you get in headphones which you know where, where you're phase inverting what you hear in order to cancel out constant uh, noise active noise cancellation yeah active noise yeah. cancellation thank you very much um, Using technologies like that with something implanted in our skull, we are going to be much more in control of what it is we're sensing, whether it's from around us or from distant signals being beamed into us in some way, shape or form. So, you know, we were talking about leading edge. I mean, I think that's going to be quite exciting. I wouldn't say it's ever going to be incredible quality. You know, if you want to listen to music on headphones, the headphones will still need to do the great job because they're going to be way more sophisticated than some small thing embedded in your skull. But for voice and for that kind of communication and potentially for cancelling noise around us, that may be very effective. So uh, that's where I think we'll, we'll be going with that. And that will help a great deal with productivity, probably, because we'll be able to have conversations with people who aren't there without everybody else hearing them. Yes, I think you know what we're passionate about and a bit of a pivot for our business away from immersive audio with some of the technologies that we are bringing to market with the Iris Flow headphones, etc. Um, we saw this this world moving virtual and we saw this uncontrollable environment being a factor. You talked about the conversation being shouted over a corner of a street and essentially physically moving yourself to an environment where you can communicate more effectively. We're trying to bring control to an environment that you can't shift from. Um, the, the sound that you want to hear, the sound that you want to listen to being allowed through to the eradication of, of everything else. And similar to active noise cancellation, this is voice isolation. Um, the, the most important part of a productivity um, scenario where you're having a, an online meeting or another use case for us is is contact centers and I actually listening to what you're saying I can think of the the mental fatigue of a contact center agent that's doing 60 70 even 100 calls a day to customers in a variety of locations with the screeching cars going by if they're outside or 
the hubbub of family life behind them if they're at home. How can we bring control to all of that and allow essentially what the most important part of that interaction is, which is the voice at either end of that call? Well, I think this is such an exciting application of AI. Uh, you know, we, we, at last we have got technology which can do this in real time. Uh, for a long time, audio professionals have had access to wonderful tools which you can use post-production to remove noise and to enhance speech and or, or vocals or whatever it might be and to do incredible things to really poorly recorded audio. Doing it in real time, that's a different ball game altogether. And so it's very exciting to see this this kind of technology happening. Uh, I mean, I've seen it in um, very sophisticated recording systems, uh, of which probably the most amazing is Descript at the moment, uh, where they have an engine probably quite similar to yours, which works on recordings. Uh, but doing it live in video conferencing, well, that's a boon, isn't it? Because uh, you can suddenly have a high quality conversation, even with somebody who's in a you know, a supermarket or a car park or uh, wherever it might be uh, without having to do so much mental work to extract signal from noise. AI can help you do that. And I think that's a great boon. Well, we're glad you think so. And it's certainly our passion and, and what we see as an incredible uh, advancement in the way that we'll be able to communicate. Um, Julian, it's been a pleasure talking to you today. Uh, I've really been fascinated by your TED Talks and to talk to you in person and understand more about your philosophy and, and passion for sound and, and listening as a skill, is, uh, it's been a real pleasure. Um, if people want to find out more about you and about uh, your, your mission in life, where can they go? Where can they find out some more detail? Well, I have a website, juliantreasure.com, and um, I have a book called How to Be Heard, which um, actually kind of sucks people in by being ostensibly about speaking, because that's what people care about more. Interestingly, my TED Talk on speaking has been seen by five times as many people as my TED Talk on listening. But the book How to Be Heard also contains a great deal of stuff about listening. I've kind of snuck it in there. Um, so it's a book about communication skills in general. Um, and that's worth visiting. I've got a, a course on the amazing platform Wondrium, uh, which people may be familiar with, which is seven hours of me talking about communication skills and sound and why it's important. Um, so any of those ways, really. And of course, if it's about corporate sound, business sound, organizational sound, then that's what the sound agency is there for. And that's the soundagency.com. Just before we go, tell us a little bit about the sound agency. So this is this is audio branding, everything from that little sign off notation, um, which, you know, is a lot of brands are trying to do that now, um, but also about setting sound stages for retail or where, where else do you go with your your work there? Yeah, we do absolutely um, the core job of audio branding, which is a sound that represents a brand in the same way that a, you know, a logo does. And uh, interestingly, I don't think Iris has got one at the moment, uh, which is something that maybe we could have a chat about. But um, yes, so that's the, the kind of core DNA for a brand. And, and, you know, we've talked about why I think it's important that brands exist in sound as well as in sight uh, in the coming years. Um, we've over the years specialized a lot actually in sound and physical spaces so shopping malls uh, all over the world um, we, we work for Unibai Radamco Westfield across Europe in their shopping malls we work for Majid Al Fotaim across the Middle East so we sonified the whole of Mall of the Emirates for example these are some very large projects we've worked for you know great stores like Harrods and so forth as I say it's not it's not usually or uh, very often it's not about music uh, music is wonderful in certain situations. I, I mean, I'm a musician, uh, as I'm sure many of you are. I love music. It's incredibly important to me. Um, but it's not a veneer. It's not something that can be lightly just smeared all over the world to make things better. It doesn't work that way. It's actually often inappropriate or played through a terrible sound system. You know, I've lost count of the number of shopping malls I've gone into where they're you know, they've got a sound system which was designed for life safety, for alarm bells. And then somebody goes, oh, 
we got a sound system. Why don't we play music? That'd be nice. No, it's not. Because you walk around and all you can hear in the whole shopping mall is... That's it. You know, I don't know what song it is. All I can hear is a snare drum and a, and a hi-hat, probably. That's it. So it's uh, just irritating a lot of the time. So we do a lot of, uh, you know, sound in space. We talked about this uh, really as well. Sound in space has got four aspects to it, which are really important. There's the acoustics of the, of the space. There's the noise that you may need to control. There's the sound system through which you're delivering the sound. And then there's the content itself. And many people ignore the first three of those and just whack music into a shop or whatever it might be. Very bad idea. You know, even the best music on top of noise is just more noise. So we need to think about all of those things. Are the acoustics suitable? Uh, is there noise that I can control and remove? Or if, there, if, if I can't, then maybe I shouldn't do anything. How good is the sound system? Has it got proper bandwidth? You know, is, is the whole spectrum being um, being um, reproduced properly? Is it distorting? Uh, you know, those kind of things are tiring and irritating and just not pleasant. And finally, with those three controlled, what would be the best sound I could put in here? It might be biophilic, it might be nature sound, it might be musical, whatever it is. It's a question of designing everything congruently so that the sound is delivering the same message that the visual design is. And that's a lot of what the sound agency is all about. That's really fascinating. Julian, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for your time. And uh, I hope we get to speak again soon because this has been... I, I struggle to think how the team are going to cut this down into some sound bites. Um, hopefully everyone out there that listens to the Iris pod is going to enjoy it. Thank you so much. It's been my pleasure, Tom. Nice talking to you.